Don't see the thing didn't kick on yet. It's a little bit of a lag here for everybody who's watching. Maybe it's going to go. How do you know? So on my screen, it shows that we're live, and then usually there's a timer. It'll show you yeah. how long that we're on for. It still hasn't kicked in, which makes me concerned. Thirty right now. Uh, maybe it won't. I, oh, there we go. Now I see it. All right. You want to lead us in? Yeah. Hi, everybody. This is Shane Hensley, and you're listening to Legends of Tabletop. Hello, and welcome, everybody, to the Legends of Tabletop podcast. As you heard, I have Shane on tonight. Hey, Shane, how's it going? Hi, everybody. <laughs> this is always so weird and uncomfortable because, you know, you send out the invite before, and we're just kind of sitting here chatting, and it's like, oh, oh hey, you're on the show now. It always makes it kind of weird. A, a message on Facebook here for the folks who might not have heard this was coming with the link. So hopefully this will work for folks. Sweet. I hope so. I also share it on the Legends Facebook page. Okay. There and hopefully this tweeted. I don't know if StreamYard always does that. Twitter is something I don't do. But uh, fortunately, Jody uh, handles that for us. So. <clears throat> yeah. it's uh, it, it, it tends to be a black hole. <laughs> It's cool though. I, I've met some really good good people on there. We you know we've added some people to our actual plays. You know, good friends and stuff now that you know we happen to meet on Twitter. So like it, it does definitely have its good uh, aspects. Of course. Well, I think it's like all social media. It's what you make of it, right? Right. Yeah. Absolutely. So I'm, I'm glad that we, we were finally able to hook up here. We had uh, sort of false starts a little bit back and forth as uh, you had some things going on, but I'm I'm excited to have you on now. I'm excited to be on. Cool, cool. If I can gush for a minute, I know nobody cares about this probably, but when we were at uh, RenCon, uh, when we came down to, uh, I was in one of your um, one of your uh, convention games, and I came down, I'm like, hey, Shane, I'm, you know, so-and-so, and whatever. And you're like, oh, yeah, I recognize you. And I'm like, oh, and that Sally Field moment of like, oh, you really like me. Because <laughs> <laughs> you never know. Like, we're friends on Facebook, but, you know, like, you're moving and shaking and, friends with all kinds of people like I'm I, moving and shaking but we all do meet a lot of people these days and it is hard to remember everybody but I, I have a pretty good memory for faces you know I certainly mess up now and then and you know every now and then I'll meet somebody's evil twin they don't ha know they have and get, right. a, get a name wrong but, but by and large I do pretty well and you know for me it's just people I enjoy gaming with and uh, you know the very very rare few I try to avoid and honestly there's just not many of those in you know, almost 30 years of doing this now. So that's pretty lucky. That is pretty good. That is pretty yep. good. Um, so I, I, I guess let's start at the beginning. Uh, how did you first get into gaming? I'm, I'm assuming it was probably D&D. &D. We're about the same age. Sure right? was. Um, so I was probably about 12 years old, and there were advertisements for Dungeons & Dragons in the back of my Marvel comics. And it was, uh, it was the one, I think it was Wormy, but it was an ad. And it ended with uh, the, the party opens the door and there's this big red dragon and it says, greetings, mortal worm. And I just thought that was the coolest thing. And I had to know what it was. So uh, the Sears catalog, the Christmas wish book, used to carry Dungeons and Dragons. And where I lived in rural southwest Virginia, you couldn't get anything like that. The nearest bookstore was three and a half hours away. Yeah. So I asked my parents for some of it for Christmas, having no idea what to order. Right? I didn't know what deities and demigods was or basic set versus experts that, you know, none of it fit together very well in the catalog. And um, they got me a hodgepodge of things and I got it and I started reading it and this whole world opened to me, right? And what was so cool is, and this was, was kind of the brilliance of what Gary did that, you know, maybe later was too much baggage, but to a, a 12, 13, 14, 16 year old mind, learning what an oligarchy was from the dungeon master's uh, guide, right? Was, was a big deal, or a theocracy, you know, all this kind of stuff. And it started opening my mind to what kind of worlds you could create, right? right? It wasn't just, you know, well, there's a king and there's knights. Okay, yeah, I got all that. But all these other cool, uh, because he gave you so much depth, which I think, you know, later on maybe was too much. But again, for a, for a kid at that age, it just really expanded my horizons in, in a way I would not have expected, right? Right. Yeah, definitely a lot of lore and stuff uh, mm -hmm. involved. Did you see the new Eberron book just came out? I, I haven't seen the inside, but the outside. Oh, my God, it's beautiful. Well, I hope they replace that cover they leaked about 
six months ago. That that cover was pretty rough. Uh, I don't remember that one. <laughs> if you go online, you'll see. I'm sure they replaced it. But yeah, it, it was not up to their standards. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, it, so, um, did you? Uh, was there ever any question when you were like, "Hey, guys, like you know, this is what I want for Christmas," especially coming from you know from Virginia of you know you were satanic panic era that all that kind of stuff I, of like, I, was, no. I, I never saw any of that we played dungeons and dragons in church i used to go to church back really then. we played dungeons and dragons in the gifted and talented program and boy scouts that, that that whole thing i think is was vastly overblown by a few places where it happened i never saw any of it yeah the only time we saw something remote i i owned a, a game store with some friends through college that's how a lot of us paid for our college and um one woman came in one day and was asking about computer games because we had just started carrying the SSI computer games and she saw Dungeons and Dragons. She's kind of went, mm, no, like that. And that was, that was it. That was the only thing I ever saw in my 30 years of doing this. I, I'm not saying it's not out there. I'm just saying I never saw. It. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I never, I didn't play way back when, so I never experienced any of that, but I never saw it either. Right. Like it just wasn't something, it's something you saw on the news. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. Well, you know, and, and not to to get off onto you know political tangent or anything, but a lot of stuff's like that. I mean, when the when the Ferguson riots were happening a few years back, um, what was that, 2015, 2014, You know, a lot of my friends in Europe thought, you know, how how are you surviving over there with American flames? And I thought, well, it's a terrible thing, but it's you know, it's it's in a couple of blocks of one city. You know, and when we see stuff on the news, you see something terrible happens in France or England. Uh, you know, it's these are small, small events. I mean, they have big repercussions, right? And, and big for the people involved. But I felt like that with gaming too. It was, you know, something that happened once or twice, got some press and was blown way out of proportion. And again, you know, and we played it in church. I used to go to youth group and run D and D for the, the kids there. And they loved it. Yeah. yeah. This we were Methodist, it's barely a church anyway. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I'm an ex-Catholic, so. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, what else? Did you play anything else at that time, or was it, like, pretty much just? Well, so once I got into that, you know, I got the catalogs that, that TSR would send and discovered um, Marvel superheroes, Conan, Indiana Jones. I never got into uh, Gamma World, really, until later. But uh, Marvel superheroes was a big thing for me because I could play whatever I wanted with it. Um, you could, you know, at the lower power levels, you could do anything you wanted. So I, I ran Mad Max, I ran John Wayne Adventures, and uh, a Conan the Barbarian adventure before the actual Conan book came out, which was one of the, which is an incredibly good box set, by the way, the original Conan from TSR, written by Zeb Cook, who I got to work with years later on City of Heroes and City of Villains. But uh, that box set was actually kind of the standard I set for my writing uh, years later. It's, it's really clean, really, really good. Cool. Very cool. And and you worked, I mean, you know, back in the day, you worked with pretty much everybody, right? I mean, White Wolf, TSR, yeah. I mean, you were all yeah. over. Yeah. So um, I got into this game called Torg when we were in college. This would have been about 91 or so. And uh, they were actually taking submissions. And um, so I sent something in and they sent it back uh, with a lot of red ink. And uh, I did the work and I sent it back again. And I guess, well, I know now. You know, a lot of people just weren't willing to go through the revisions and, and do, you know, do the extra work. It wasn't because I was some brilliant writer or anything. I was just, I'm a hard worker. So I sent it back in and they printed it. And then, uh, you know, I did a couple of more for West End Games and met some nice people. And that led to being able to work at TSR and White Wolf and FASA and, you know, just about anybody you can imagine in that era. I probably did something for them. Yeah. And were you freelancing all that time? Sure was. Yeah, it was all freelance. I was going to graduate school and writing games at night. Very cool. So, so when, once you got into D and D, the bug got you. Like that was it. It was, and I, you know, I certainly didn't realize it. Even when I was freelancing, I never really thought I would do this full time. I, I was, I was training to go into the CIA. <laughs> I took <laughs> Russian. And my master's is in special ops. So I, you know, I was going down a very different path. But it, it just, uh, it just took hold, and, and here I am. That's very cool. Well, and I guess some of that comes in useful in the, doing some setting work and things like that to have that that kind of background. I think my uh, 
my history background maybe comes into play more because um, one of the things I realized at this point in uh, in the things I do is having a, a big breadth of knowledge. You know, if you sit and quiz me on, uh, you know, what kind of cavalry the Byzantines fielded in 1120, I'm not going to know it, but I'll know that they did and I know how to find it. Right. So, I, and I, like I said, I'm a hard worker, so I'll go do my research. But uh, I, I wish I could recall facts better than most of my friends do. But uh, I don't know where to find them. And I, you know, I, I keep a lot of stuff in my head and I get to bring some of that to the games we play. I mean, I wrote a, um, a Shatter Zone adventure that was basically Rourke's Drift, <laughs> you know, yeah. which is a Zulu War uh, battle. So I've done all kinds of, of weird stuff like that that you, know, you won't recognize unless you know what it, what it comes from. Sure, sure. Does does having that background um, sort of inform the games when you're you know developing settings and things like that? Does that kind of play in? I assume it has to, right? Absolutely, and I think that's probably fairly obvious. Where it might not be as obvious is the rules. So, for example, when I was creating the original Deadlands, the combat system was informed by two things. One was the outlaw Josie Wales. I wanted every bullet to feel like chunk, chunk, right? I mean, like it's it's hitting flesh and you feel it and it's painful and the, the player and the character feels as much as is possible uh, between the dice and, and you marking a wound on your character sheet or whatever, right? Right. But the other thing was, um, and I think Steve Jackson posted this somewhere, but there was a shootout in, um, in, in the middle of the night in this little canyon somewhere down on the border, uh, you know, which was far away from me when I wrote about it, but it was very close now. And it was fascinating. It's kind of like the, the shootout at the OK Corral where, you know, 30 bullets were fired in 30 seconds and there's there's about seven hits, right, by these legends of the Old West who you'd think couldn't miss at 12 feet. Right. But the same thing happened in this little dark canyon. There's all this automatic gunfire and some pistols and 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 bullets are very random. You know, if they hit a guy in just the right place, dead instantly. If they hit you in a, you know, in a, in a good place. Uh, it might bounce off a bone. If you go, it could go right through you. It could just cause a flesh wound. Now, all those things will hurt, but it's it's fascinating, and it's why I like random damage and and the way we do things in Savage Worlds now, right? Where I you might like um, in in the Great Northfield Northfield raid, I think Bill Doolin was hit like twenty two times, yes. right? On only a couple of those actually did any real damage. Same thing can happen in the game, and that's why variable damage or you know rolling dice for it is really interesting to me because you roll that really high total, you've hit the guy. Let's say monster. We don't want to kill people, right? The monster in some place important that it drops. Whereas if you roll really badly, you know you crease a muscle or something like that. So my study of of some of the stuff, you know, both for gaming and for history, you know, really uh, kind of informs how I interpret the rules and think that that they ought to work. And and then there you go. Right. And, and it's cool. I, like, I think sometimes we get hung up in the mechanics of it as players. You are like, you know, um, you know, you took a wound or in Cthulhu, you know, you take, you know, you get shot and you take eight damage and then you, you know, you do a medicine roll and like, Oh, now you're not hurt anymore. Well, yeah. But like narratively, like I didn't get shot in the heart, right? Like right. Maybe wing me. So like, you know, you put on a bandage and, you know, we check it out. I'm like, Oh geez, it was just a flesh wound. It's not that you right. didn't get hit. Exactly. It yeah. just wasn't like, Oh my God, there's a lot of blood. Oh, right. no, it's not that bad. <laughs> it's interesting, too, right? Because, like, so many times running a game, I'll, I'll, I'll give somebody a wound or something in Savage Worlds, and I say, yeah, it hits you right in the leg, and you're limping around, and I describe it, right? And from that moment on, they role play that injury, even though it's really just a minus one and one off your pace, right? Which is, you know, which is right. But they'll really role play it and get into it, and they, if you describe it a little bit like that, they'll usually take it on themselves to, to play it out. Yeah, but it's usually, like, you know, those bad roles or like, you know, that critical, like, oh shit, are we going to make it makes for the best games. Like if you just succeed at everything, eh, I mean, that's okay. But like, that's not a great story, you know, right? Yeah, exactly. it's when you fall off the roof or like yeah. crash the car or whatever, you're like, oh my God, do you remember? Yeah. And it's, it's kind of my, my philosophy on these games. And I think it works pretty well in ours is, you know, the average results just kind of keep us moving forward. Right. But it's the extremes that we're going to remember. The critical fail or the, you know, I rolled a 32 on my damage and killed him in one shot kind of stuff. That's right. the stuff that sticks with you forever. 
Right. And, and we had a little bit of that at RingCon in, in the game that we were playing. I got to, to shoot a party member <laughs> and, and, uh, and then got to shoot the dynamite to blow up the monster. And like, yeah, like everybody uh-huh. at the table is screaming. Like, that's just so right. cool. Yeah, I always like to have the rowdiest table at the con. <laughs> we had a pretty rowdy table. <laughs> we did. Uh, well, I, I think you receded a little bit. I think everybody knew you except for me, I guess. <laughs> But it was cool, and, and like we finished super quick, and it was like, wow, oh, I guess we're going to the bar. Like, hell yeah, <laughs> yeah, which was a lot of fun. Uh, well, do, if, you, the, if the group solves the adventure, they solve the adventure, right? So yeah, yeah, you drag it out, right? Now, do you get to to go to a lot of cons during the course of the year? Or no, um, the last two years I've stopped going to a lot of them um, mm-hmm. for various reasons. But um, I'm back into it now, and I, I kind of do it in you know, one of two ways, either as a guest, of course. But what I really prefer to do when I can is just go for myself, especially if I have friends who are going, because we can uh, you know, play the games we want to play. Everybody's in a hotel, so if we have a few drinks, it's no big deal. You know, nobody has to drive or anything. Uh, and I don't have to – I can hang out with guys like you, and we can just talk and be friends, and I don't have to – I don't have to do the guest thing, right, and do do all the, the panels and games and stuff, which I enjoy too. But I also enjoy just hanging out and talking to people and you know just hearing what, what's on their minds. Right, you're you're not on on the stage, as it were. Yeah, and I don't know how much of a difference there is, but there is in my mind at least. And I also I don't get to play much when I go as a guest of honor. I feel mm-hmm. guilty. I feel like you know I want to earn my keep and make sure I'm doing my job. But when I go on my own, I can jump into you know something weird I would never play on my own and give it a try and learn from it, which I do all the time. I mean, I play everything I can get my hands on. I don't <laughs> necessarily love everything, but you know, I'll find something good and interesting that you know will, will spark ideas. Right, right. Now you were play testing a scenario at RingCon this year. Do you typically bring stuff to a con that you're sort of working on, or do you? No, I typically run one of five or six adventures that I'm really comfortable with because then I can do my best job focusing on the players and making sure they're all having fun and, you know, being included. Uh, I do sometimes generally it's, um, it's stuff I'm familiar with. Okay. Uh, what, what's your best con experience been either something at the table or uh, just, just overall. Ooh. Man, it's like, what's your favorite Christmas? <laughs> that might not be a fair question. <laughs> um, well, I'll name a few things. So the first time I walked into Gen Con, uh, you know, it was like gamer's nirvana, right? Mm-hmm. And I was just, I walked, I don't know, maybe 100 feet in, looked around, and I had to walk back out because it was just sensory <laughs> overload. And I just had to go, oh, my God, this is going to be the best thing ever. And then walk around and look at all the dealer tables and all the stuff I'd never heard of which is, you know, the best thing about those kind of conventions. Um, I guess kind of a soppy answer, but I really, and and I, there's so many I can't, you know, pick one, but I love just going out and meeting fellow gamers just like you, people I would game with at home. And we are just so lucky. And I don't know how we get this lucky because I've run games for other companies and it's, it's not always the same, hmm. but... of the people that I've run games for, for Savage Worlds, you know, I'd be happy to game with at my house, their house, whatever. And, uh, and I just love that, you know, and I I tend to stay in touch with them for decades. So you're screwed. (laughs) Uh, That's okay. I I think I'll manage. (laughs) Do you you think it's a difference in the philosophy of the system? Maybe that, that, attracts a certain kind of player, a certain kind of person, as opposed to say, you know, D and D or something like that. Not, not that D and D players are bad or anything like that. Sure, but yeah. It's just different mindset. Maybe. No, I think it's true. Um, our game is very swingy. We, we call it. So that means you have to, to some degree, be willing to go with the flow. Right. So, uh, you know, sometimes you're going to roll really badly and bad things will happen and you have to laugh and move on. Sometimes, uh, you know, you'll have the best moment of your life and you get to sit there and smile and watch all your friends smile at you. And and that's great. Whereas games that are more level like D&D, uh, the highs and lows 
are um, not as not as wide, I think, mm -hmm. right? And that has its own advantages too. Right. But uh, you know, you're not going to roll a 42 damage and kill King Kong in one shot and do. Yeah. You, know, you might roll a 20 and do double damage or whatever your you know, cool crit thing is, but it's not not quite as big. To a miss is a miss, you know. Whereas a critical failure in our game, you know, you're you're probably screwed depending on what's going on and how mean the GM is. So, yeah, I think there's there's some of that. Okay, I I, I have a feeling. Oh, let me move my cat here. <laughs> um, <laughs> that like you know for D and D, uh, you know it's more of it seems like to me in my opinion. Uh, it's more of a like a power gamer sort of thing, right? Because you you want to get the thing to get the better AC to do the more damage to get the better thing to you know, and it's just that sort of vicious cycle where you're sort of you know set above you're and you know you're a little bit better than everybody at the start. Like it kind of you know feeds into that sort of cycle where a lot of these other games don't have that feeling to it. Well, that's an interesting point too. Uh in the MMOs that I've worked on, I've worked on Neverwinter Online, City of Heroes, City of Villains, End of Nations. I worked on one that hopefully will be announced soon. That's you know a, a big title, but um, we there's a leveling curve, right? And it's just like D and D. It goes just like this: as your level goes up, the monsters that you're fighting go up too. So the items that you get give you these little peaks along the way, right, where you feel more powerful, which means you know they're all about loot. And loot's fun, and, and it's, you know it's a tried and true thing that's that's worked for decades. We don't do much of that. Right. Uh, ours tends to be more about, and this is going to sound pejorative, but I don't mean it this way. Ours is more about telling the story and the role playing uh, than it is loot. Uh, and that is not to say that D and D or D twenty games don't have tons of that because I know ours do. I mean, we we role play that. My son ran a 5e campaign not so long ago, and uh, some of the best role playing I've seen out of our group it was, it was fantastic. That's but, awesome. Um, you know, systemically, I think D and D definitely, and a lot of those games are driven a bit more by loot. Certainly on the computer game side. But. For sure, for sure. And, and so you've done both then. So you, you computer games, tabletop games. You actually done some card games, board games. You're you're all over the map. <laughs> yeah, I've. I've I've done a little bit of everything, I think. I've done historical miniatures, fantasy miniatures, collectible card games, non-collectible card games. Uh, I haven't published any board games that I've created, but I have made a couple. Uh, you'll see some soonish, I hope. Um, and a lot of RPGs, novels, short stories, computer games. I've, I've been around. I've been doing this for a while, so you'd hope. Okay. And you're still working a full time job, right? Like this is this is all in addition to. No, this is my full time job. This this is it now. Yeah. Oh yeah, more than okay, full time. Cool. I work. I work two full time jobs doing this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I love it. So. Nice. So I worked in computer games on and off for, oh, 15 years, I guess. And during some of that, other people would run the company, and I'd still write stuff and kind of guide it. But you know, they had to do the day to day stuff. And then about uh, eight years ago, I started doing it full time again for a quick trip down to Austin to work on a big game. I told you, hopefully we'll, we'll be announced soon. But uh, yeah, this is this is where my heart is. Cool. Very cool. And and the thing that, that seems to be a little bit snake bit in all this is is getting some sort of a Deadlands. You know, we had an MMO and a you know, card game and, you know, some of these things. What, what, what do you what do you think, you know, kind of underlies that where that just hasn't really maybe uh, me, or my, my, <laughs> my primary interests are rpgs and that's what i make uh you know aeg did doomtown and we still do that we still uh do it in partnership with pine box now we handed it off to them there is a really big deadlands board game on the way nice uh but you know i've if somebody is better at doing something than we are, I am happy for them to do so. Um, and the people that are doing this one are, I mean, they're big, they're AAA. And um, <clears throat> hopefully we'll be able to announce it maybe by Gen Con this year, but it'll, it'll be a big one. Uh, Doomtown continues to happen. And then um, there's some smaller stuff you'll see too. But I mean, first off, we got to get Deadlands, the RPG back in print. It's been out of print for two years now. Oh wow! We wanted to wait because we knew the new edition was coming, the new edition of the core rules, 
who wanted to get all the Deadlands books, Simpatico, so all the Harrowed work the same and all that kind of stuff. And that's what myself, Matt Cutter, and John Goff have been working on for the last year. So right. I'm finishing touches on Lost Colony. That's what's on my screen right now. And uh, Matt Cutter is finishing up The Weird West, which we hope to kickstart in January, maybe February. But yeah, it's uh, it's coming. Cool. Very cool. One of the, one of the very first podcasts that I listened to was uh, it was Gamers Haven, and they had a long-term uh, Deadlands campaign. It was just a, t- a ton of fun to listen to. And the cool thing about podcasts is you get to experience – you know, these different systems and different different play styles and, and all these different games without, you know, making the leap. Like, I don't know what this is. So you can like look up almost anything and like, oh, this is cool. Now I want to buy this now because it sounds awesome. Yeah. Do you well, that's one of the big benefits of all the YouTube channels now too, right? You get to yeah. see it and really experience it. Uh, I wish I was a little more photogenic <laughs> and uh, had a desire to be on, on video more, but I just don't. But fortunately, we have people like the Wild Cards Gang, and uh, of course, you saw the the recent Undeadwood that was just fantastic. So, you know, we'll we'll help support others to do it for us. I think going forward, and, and it was very cool. I saw they have like you know media licenses on the website. So, like if we decided we were going to run a Deadlands game when the new system comes out, we could be right. you know Savage Worlds, you know, media licensee. Like that's a really cool thing. I've never seen that with another. Uh, we're good before well it's tricky right and the reason we put it up there is because if you're going to get official sponsorship or promotion or anything from us we want to make sure it hits certain standards now we don't read scripts we you know we don't micromanage anything but uh if something's bad for our community you know we're going to step in and say something but by and large again our fans are are great so it's not something we normally have to worry about but it's there if we need to do you listen to any podcasts yourself or no? So not much. I listen to uh, Sounds Like Crows when I can. I watch the wild cards when I can. Uh, of course, I listen to um, Savage Interludes by Ron, who's now doing our um, peg cast or peg show. Um, but it's hard for me because, uh, you know, I'm always writing and I can't listen to anything but like soundtracks and stuff when I'm writing. If I get to do like graphic design work or I'm just paying bills or something like that, that's when I'll do it. Mm-hmm. But uh, not as often as I'd like. That's fair. I, I listen probably too much. <laughs> <laughs> I just started listening to the uh, Young and Holt uh, podcast, and it's a Deadlands game. So uh, for, uh, through the first couple episodes, and that, that's been a lot of fun so far. Okay. Yeah, uh, that's the only Savage Worlds on my in my queue right now. <laughs> okay. I'll check it out. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely pretty cool. Um, Wow, I'm gonna have to edit now because I just totally blanked out. <laughs> um, you guys just wrapped up a Kickstarter on Monday, uh, mm-hmm. and it was a double Kickstarter. So what? You know, one is a ton of work by itself. What what led you to to go ahead and go? Ah, hey, you know what? Let's just let's do two. Um, so there's a lot of there's a lot of challenge for people in the middle tier, which was which is where we're at. Uh, stores just don't carry a lot of RPGs. <clears throat> like they'll carry our core stuff, but they don't carry a lot of the, the secondary stuff. So we do most of that online or through Kickstarter. Now we have a retailer program where we send them the Kickstarter stuff ahead of traditional distribution. You know, I, I own a store for 10 years. I want stores to carry our stuff, but I understand the challenges, especially in the days of the board game glut. Mm-hmm. So that leaves us with Kickstarter and uh, Kickstarter has got all kinds of problems. And the interface is terrible, and, and there are issues, right? But it's still the best thing going for for a company like us. And uh, running two is not really much harder than running than running one because when you're running one, you have to pay attention. I don't want to say 24/7, but many hours of the day to comment <clears throat> to comments or you know, well, this thing that we put up as a stretch goal just isn't. Nobody really cares about it, or this thing's taken off. Let's do more of it, right? So if you're already kind of given the attention cycles to one, doing a second is not that big a deal, especially when it's kind of a low key one, like we knew Wendigo Tales would be, which is our fiction. And, um, you know, those are one of the things you have to get over. I think if you're going to do this kind of stuff consistently is, um, you know, we did the, the Savage Worlds core Kickstarter and it was, you know, over half a million bucks. 
we do something like Wendigo, Wendigo Tales and it's under 16,000 and people might see that as um, as failure. We don't. It's a it's a whole different animal. Right. 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 And um, fiction for us, besides the fact that it's something we want to do and enjoy doing it. Um, when we go and talk to Hollywood about movies and so forth, one of the problems they have is we're a world, not a story. Right. So we want to give them some things that they or their writers or whatever can key off of. And um, Wendigo Tales is a big part of that. And we've had interest in a lot, well, all of our lines besides just Deadlands. And they're looking for, okay, well, you know, what does this world feel like? Who are the heroes? That kind of stuff. And that's a big deal. And again, you know, we just enjoy it. But we don't care. I mean, of course, we want high totals. But something like, you know, Wendigo Tales, we'll sell it for years to come. We'll do the, uh, the late pledge stuff. And then a lot of people who order Lost Colony, um, when they go to do their, their pledge, they'll add Wendigo Tales. They'll add the last couple of 32 pages we've done, uh, stuff like that. And, and that's okay. We understand they're doing it because the shipping is so high these days, yeah. especially for international customers. So they just want to put it you know, all, in one, all in one shipment. So it's an unfortunately kind of boring business reason, again, why we do them two at once, too. But if we did Lost Colony and Wendigo Tales afterwards, it wouldn't be as easy to combine their shipping. Right. And, and they, I guess there's there's a certain saturation point, too, with the the lower funding goal for uh, the Wendigo Tales. You know, if you're like, oh, we're going to run a Kickstarter for this. Oh, and then we're going to run a Kickstarter for this. Like, you've got to sort of manage the community's um, uh, receptiveness to, to multiple Kickstarters. Because, like you say, being in, you know, sort of in the middle area, like, this is, like, you're not just going to go out and print 12,000 books. You know, Kickstarter is... I mean, I guess for all intents and purposes, these days, kind of a, a pre-order system. It is. And it gives you an idea of how many you are going to print. And, and, you know, some people get upset about that, but that's just that's just the way things are now. But what they need to understand is a lot of people think we're a big company, but you know, we're not. We're two and a half full time employees and a whole bunch of contractors. And uh, the way it used to be is I would print those 12,000 books and pray to God they sold. Right. Right. And, right. you know, we bet wrong many times. And the company went, or well, I went bankrupt at one point because of it. Uh, you know, I don't ever want to go through that again. You know, I like being able to pay people what they're worth and make great products. And, you know, all we hear about for especially the Savage World's Essentials, Essentials box set is how awesome it is and how happy people are with the components inside, right? That's what I want to focus on, not mm -hmm. scraping by or, you know, praying that something sells. And Kickstarter has allowed that. So for all its faults, and there are plenty, you know, it's, it's done wonders for those of us in the middle tier. Yeah. Yeah. So do you have like a, an average for the year? Do you, you know, expect to run something, you know, every quarter or twice a year? Or is well, it just we always plan uh, about once a quarter. Um, and sometimes, and we have managed to do that in a couple of years. Sometimes if things just aren't ready, you know, they have to slip. But I think what we're going to move to soon is, what, what several companies are doing, including Ulysses, who I do uh, some work with, you know, they're good friends of ours, uh, where we do our big new releases on Kickstarter, but we'll do our follow-up products on something like Game On or Indiegogo or something like that, where we can just tell fans of that particular product, hey, it's live, come and get it, hopefully enough to pay for the print run at least, and then we don't have to worry about marketing so much to new eyeballs, right? We'll save that for the big new stuff. Sure, sure. And that would probably be like almost a once a month thing eventually. Hmm. Okay. That's cool. Because we're growing pretty fast and I'm, I'm trying very carefully to manage that growth because when I was 20 something and started all this, we just boomed out the gate and we hired too many people and printed too much stuff. And that's what caused, that's what caused our trouble. But you know, what did I know at that age? <laughs> I know a lot more now. Well, and, and, that, and that was the industry too at the time. I mean, you're looking at, you know, uh, second ed going into third ed and all the splat books and like, you know, you've got to propel, you know, once you've got, a, you know, a GM's guide and a player's guide, I, you know, you've sold your line. Like that's it. Unless you can provide, you know, a lot of other incidental materials and then, okay. and then that's tough again. Cause then it comes to like managing the market. How much, you know, can I push how much are people willing to, to pay right and yeah. spend on a thing? Like we all love games, but, you know, resources are, are, in, are uh, finite. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. yeah so I, I, I don't envy your position. <laughs> well, 
It, it's certainly tricky, right? And as you say, you know, once you have the core books, and this has been D&D's problem from the beginning too, right? I mean, most of us like to create our own stuff. You just don't need anything else. And, uh, and we're okay with that, and we cater to it. You know, there's so much in that Savage Worlds core book now that, I mean, you really don't need anything else. But I think what we try to do is make the things that we, we do try to sell people the most interesting, cool, over-the-top stuff we can make, right? So, you know, not only hopefully will they enjoy it, but it will inspire their own works as well. And it should be just as fun to read as it, as it is to play. But where I think a lot of us fell flat back in the 90s is we knew people were reading way more than they were playing. So there wasn't as quite as much play testing and so forth. We work really hard to make things playable. We don't always succeed. You know, some things that sometimes a rule just won't work in certain situations. But by and large, we work really hard to make our stuff playable. Cool. And it shows. It's a focus. Yeah. Well, I hope so. Uh, so, you know, coming from a D and D background, uh, you know, you came out with Savage World. What was sort of the the impetus, or what 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 did you um, not see other systems doing that you were like, you know, what I, I think I want to say I could do this better, but that that we can do something different that that's going to achieve something that I'm not seeing. Yeah, there were. I guess it's kind of an evolution because. Um, you know, I used to work on Dark Sun and Ravenloft primarily for TSR. And, uh, and man, I just loved the uniqueness of those settings. And that certainly stuck. And we always try to put a, a twist on our stuff. Um, the rules would sometimes be frustrating for me. Like, I, I like to play thieves and rogues. And, uh, you know, somebody might tell me in Dark Sun to sneak up the tower and take out the guard, right? Well, unless you're first level or the guards first level, you're, you're really going to sneak up there and then bludgeon the guy to death over the next six rounds. <laughs> yeah. I mean, unless you've got you know, some huge critical hit rules from dragon or, you know, something like that. So that's uh, certainly something we wanted. Uh, once I played Torg uh, and, you know, the genius of Torg that uh, Greg Gordon and Bill Slavisek and that whole crew put into it is, you could be a face character and be useful in combat. So you didn't have to just pet, play a combat monster, right? right? And we really wanted that. We wanted the the acrobatic thief and the the smart ass and you know all these different kind of character types to feel awesome and empowered even during combat because you know combat happens a lot. I didn't want to track hit points. You know, I, I use the example in the book, but it, it's literally from my life. I was playing. D and D with Dwarven Forge uh, stuff with my kids when they were little, like um, seven and four, and I was writing down on a piece of paper, you know, this this skeleton has seven hit points. Now he's got four hit points, and it's the skeleton with the, the chip of paint missing on his skull, right? And I'm like, oh my god, I don't want to do this. <laughs> so it was really important to me to be up, down, or off the table, right? That's what the figures right. are. They're up, down means they're shaken, or they're dead, they're out of the game, whatever's you know wrong with them, uh, and that's. That was kind of the, the impetus for how, how the combat system works. I knew I wanted to use miniatures because it came from the Great Rail Wars. And I didn't want to have to use miniatures because it also came from Deadlands. So you can do theater of the mind. And especially in the new edition, I think we've really got a, a much better delineation of, you know, whichever you want to use, there's clear rules for how to do that. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a process. Okay. And, and was there any, so it, it came out in 2003. So we just got the second edition uh, last year, uh, end of 20, 2018. Uh, so 13, 14 years. Uh, was there any thought prior to like, Hey, we need to get a new edition out or again, it was just, you know, sort of an evolution of, you know, listening to people's feedback over the course of years and things like that. Yeah, It's really the latter. And uh, you know, a few things were, broken like tests of wills and tricks just weren't very good and those were important to me like i said from the torque stuff they just didn't work like i wanted them to a lot of little things here and there but by and large it was just knowing that um the savage you know we we did do there weren't additions but there were slight changes in each printing until we got to deluxe which has like i don't know eight or nine printings um but yeah it was just time to clean it up you know i kept hearing so when I wrote the original Deadlands, one of the greatest compliments I got was from Ed Stark, who was at TSR at the time. He'd been my editor at West End Games, and he said that he read it cover to cover in one evening. Now, I won't hold it, but that's probably not true. But uh, it was very kind of him to say so, and it really you know, inspired me. A lot of what we heard with Savage Worlds Deluxe is how unreadable it was, right? So I really wanted to make a better effort for Suede to be 
as useful and reference friendly as it was readable. And you can be the judge of that, but I certainly haven't heard nearly as many people say, ah, it's so awful to, awful to read. So hopefully we hit that mark. Yeah, I, I, I've been working my way through it over lunch, and I, it seems like a pretty easy read to me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's got to be reference first, right? Because you, you want to yeah. look something up in the middle of a game. But hopefully it, it does flow better now. Mm -hmm. and and, I think and, the whole Red and Gabe thing makes it more interesting, too. Yeah. Well, and, and if you want more of, you know, readable, then you're going to jump into those setting books. You're going to, you know, Conan or Lankmar or... Well, that know, was the thought at the time. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> Well, because that's where you're going to draw all your, your your influence, your story from, your your background stuff um, to really sort of, you know, delve into the system. Like you said, you can use the, the core book to, you know, run anything that you want to, but, you right. know, you pick up one of those settings books and, you know, it gives you the, the cool edges that really pertain to, like, you know, the, those story worlds and all those elements and stuff. Yeah. Like, that's, that's, like, that's the cool part. Right. And you guys have, what, like 21 settings listed on the website i think or something like that there's a, there's, ton. There's a bunch <laughs> no, there's it, a lot. it's our strength and our weakness our strength is that we have all this variety of stuff and it inspires people to create their own right our weakness is unlike say pathfinder where we can just dedicate all of our products to one line and build this huge following you know we just haven't done that so one of our goals right now actually is to refocus a bit on some of our bigger lines. You know, we just haven't made as much with Deadlands as as we as we want to. I don't want to quite get back to the 1990s where we had all the different splat books and you know a product a month kind of thing. But uh, you know, a happier medium there, I think, will make make everybody happy. Okay, cool. Um, do you think that that games sort of become an artifact of the of the time of of when they you know sort of were published? You know, like we had, you know, when D&D &D came out and then you had this big push for all these D20 systems. And then, you know, you had White Wolf and, then you, you know, dice pools and like, that's the way to go. Um, do, or are they yeah. more living systems, do you think? Uh, I, I think absolutely. I mean, certainly so within the source material. I mean, when I redid Hell on Earth Reloaded, looking at the original Hell on Earth where I said you could capture like 15 minutes of audio or video, but not both. Right. And now you can capture how many hours on your cell phone, you know, in crystal clear HD. Uh, so certainly in the setting stuff. Yes. In the rules. Yeah. And uh, this this edition takes a lot of inspiration from things like, uh, you know, story based games like Fate and so forth. But um, for me and the people that I tend to play with, it's a better it's a better mix of uh, crunchy die roll mechanics underneath the hood with the narrative uh, toppings or descriptions of what those things mean, right? So uh, my wife, we're, test we're play testing Necessary Evil 3 right now, which is the, the cosmic Necessary Evil. And she's playing uh, Vera Smash, which is uh, an underground superhuman cage fighter who took uh, irradiated steroids and has become Hulk-like, right? So every time she does a fighting role, she's describing some cool move she sees, you know, from some TV show or, or movie, you know, well, I'm going to jump up at the air and spin kick, or I'm going to use two handed overhand or whatever. Right. But it's just a fighting role. Right. right. It's just a fighting role. <laughs> uh, tests and support roles are probably my real favorite right now. Support is, is just great. Right. So I had somebody doing tracking in a Deadlands Dark Ages play test. And um, one guy is rolling actual survival for tracking. Another player is using his alchemy to just light up some of his little pots and provide some light down mm. low where the plants are. Another guy is using notice to watch the trees because they were afraid this witch was following them. And another one was actually rolling survival to add to tracking, right? So everybody had something to do and could contribute. And it was all narrative. You know, it's just a die roll. that gives them a plus one or a plus two. But the mm. way they described it, they role played it. They felt like their characters were doing it, just like we were talking about earlier with the wounds. You know, they took it on themselves to think, well, I'm doing this now. And, you know, mechanically, it works, too. What I have had trouble with in pure story-based games um, are the quiet players. So, you know, in a game, like, a game like Fade or something like that, and this is not to disparage, I think they're brilliant. You and I could play Fade, and we just tear it up, right? We're into it. We're being proactive. We're just all over the place. Um, somebody like my wife, who loves to role play, just isn't one of those people. You know, she'll have her moments in the sun and uh, 
and, and have you know really great spotlight moments. But really, most of the time, it's because she's got some really bad or really gay, great die roll that gives her the spotlight and she'll take advantage of it, right? And right. You, you get those in a lot of the, the pure narrative games. I guess my other issue with those two is I was raised on, my mother uh, is a big murder mystery fan, so I was raised on Ellery Queen and Agatha Christie. And you and I deciding who the murderer is is not as exciting to me as figuring out who the murderer is. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. right. But, those are all my only real complaints with them. I've had great times playing lots of them. Fiasco, Fate, all those. Yeah. What do you feel about the new um, Edge of the Empire, that the like, Genesis system, I guess, from Fantasy Flight with this sort of you know narrative base where you can succeed and fail? We have a Day Trippers campaign. It's also narrative. So I played it in Warhammer. I never actually got to play it in Star Wars, um, but I did write some of, the, some of the Star Wars weapons for I did write the Star Wars weapons for Edge of the Empire. Um, my feeling is, while it's a it's a brilliant idea that, that Jay Little had to do that, I think for me personally, it gets it gets a little tiring after a while to have to describe how I fail or succeed, you know, using all the different dice. So I really like it for a short bit. It gets a little old to me after a while. Sometimes I just want to say I hit or didn't. But right. you can do that. But that doesn't quite feel like the spirit of the game to me. But I, mean, I think it's I think it's a brilliant idea. Interesting. Yeah, I enjoy like, one of the aspects I enjoy about playing games is just adding details. You know, just adding descriptions of of things you're doing, or you know, even like as a player, uh, you know, what's in the room. You know, if there's no descriptions, like oh, when I walk in, I see blah blah blah. And then if it doesn't, you know, it's it's an inconsequential detail. It just adds a lot of flavor. Like I just I get so much enjoyment out of that sort of like world building aspect. Right. Of you know, as long as you're not breaking, so, oh, I find the shotgun or whatever, you know? <laughs> yeah. I'm terrible at that as a GM. I, I, I gloss over my descriptions way too quickly. As a player, I'm much better at it. I do the same thing you do, right? I'm like, okay, so this is an old man's lonely bedroom. He's got to have his dentures in a cup on the nightstand. He's going to have, uh, you know, a calendar on the wall that he hasn't changed in three years, you know, stuff like that, right? That'll come to me. But as a GM... Yeah. I'm a little too focused on everybody's actions or something, I guess. And I wish I was better at that when I run a game. Well, and it's hard, right? So like if you're, you know, coming into a dungeon, like then you have to imagine like everything that could possibly be in this dungeon, you know, for a player to interact with. So sometimes it's just better to be like, okay, yeah, these, this is the lighting. This is what you, you know, these are the major features. Sure. And then kind of leave it to the players to like, oh, there's a, you know, pile of skulls because the guy is a bad guy they were trying to find or whatever, you know. Right. Like, it doesn't change the nature of the story. It doesn't like mechanically give you benefit or disadvantage, just cool flavor. Right. Yeah. Well, and it can turn into something, right. Especially if they try to do one of those tests or support. Like if you know, there's a blanket on the bed, you might use a, you know, throw it on somebody and use it as a test or a grapple or something. Yeah. Right. Right. I play with a friend, uh, Kurt, and we were playing our fear itself game and I'm like, Oh yeah, you know, this happens and this happens. Like, Oh, there's John. There he goes just saying whatever he wants to say. And I'm like, yeah, but like, it's cool. Yep. <laughs> you do it too. Come on. It's fun. <laughs> That's right. Yep. Uh, is there a game that you wish that you had a chance to work on that you never did? No, not a game. I mean, there's a setting that I would sure love to do sometime. Thundar. I would love to do Thundar the Barbarian. Uh, everything right. else, um, you know, that's why that's why I own the company, so I can do what I want. Right. <laughs> do we have new settings in the work then? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, like I said, we're trying to focus on our big games right now and getting support done, but there are two big announcements coming next year that will surprise people, I think. Very cool, very cool. Um, and and you uh, off the air. I know this already, but I'll ask the question. Um, you have a regular gaming group that you get to play with. I do. Yep, we play every Wednesday. That's that's awesome. Now, yeah. do you run or do you actually get to play? Uh, we take turns. So I'll, we'll usually run an adventure, which might last three or four sessions, and then somebody else will do it. So like right now, Daryl Hayhurst, Daryl Hayhurst, who you probably know, mm -hmm. is uh, is running Necessary Evil Three for us. And I'll tell you what. That guy, he's just a great GM. He's a great person. He's a great designer and a writer. But he's just one of the funniest GMs you'll ever have. 
we had a three-headed space judge talking to us the other day, and each head had a different personality. <laughs> we just could not stop laughing. That's great. <laughs> now, do you guys run the same system, or do you jump from different uh, systems? So right now, we're all we're all playing Savage Worlds because we do we have so much stuff to test. But when something cool comes out that we want to try, we absolutely do it. Okay. Like I said, my son ran a five E campaign for oh, a good six months. And we oh, alternated nice. between that and other stuff. But yeah, it was great. Now, were you interested in the uh, the Aliens RPG that came out? Was that something that you got in on, or no? No, I didn't. Uh, I'm an Aliens fan. The RPGs have never really grabbed me for some reason. If I was going to do it, I just did it in Savage Worlds, and I have done it in Savage Worlds. Yeah, yeah. Before it came out, I was looking for the perfect thing to try to run, you know, some kind of homebrew. Like, oh, well, let's do the Aliens movie. Like, we'll just do it like yeah. one or two nights. We'll play. And I, I, it didn't even occur to me to do it in Savage Worlds. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you a quick anecdote. So years ago, Clint Black was running a game for us uh, at some convention, maybe Origins or something, just, you know, us and the peg group. And we were um, – it was after – uh, whatever the big hurricane in Florida was, Andrew, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were like a goodwill tour to show people that help was coming and all this kind of stuff. So we were back along one of the big channels. And my character was a, um, a pop singer who had been an archery champion in high school. Another guy, or, no, I, I that was a different character. I was the big construction worker with a, a, a big chainsaw so I could help, you know, get people trapped out of their houses or whatever. There was a camera crew because of the big pop star. It was really cool, right? So we're going back there. We're helping people. We're telling the story. We're kind of getting deeper and deeper into the the, the back uh, canals of Florida. And uh, suddenly these people come running at us. We're like, what's going on? And they're running there. Ah! And they're screaming in panic, right? And this guy gets up to him and says, you've got to help. You've got to help. They're attacking. They're attacking. We're like, what are you talking about? And uh, suddenly, let's see if you can see it. He suddenly goes, whoa. <laughs> And the chest worker comes out of the shirt. Right? <laughs> nice. like, oh my God, this is aliens. <laughs> we had no idea, right? We genu genuinely thought it was going to be like a realistic modern day kind of thing. And then the worst part is, I said, wait, 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 wait. This is this is Hurricane Andrew, right? It's really hot, isn't it? And he goes, oh yeah. I was like, oh crap. Sure enough, three little dots appear on somebody's face, right? <laughs> so. You know, I've played Alien, and it was scary as hell. And let me tell you what, a chainsaw is a terrible weapon to use on aliens. I would imagine it would be. <laughs> oh, that's great. But it was really cool. I mean, I'd love to play Colonial Marines too, right? But it was really cool to kind of play that fish out of water. And then Clint had all the hero clicks. I think they were horror clicks. Uh, yeah. Aliens. Right, and he's got one on a light pole and one, you know, he's had like a whole set. And then, of course, there was the queen we had to fight. It's just great. That's cool. That's very cool. <laughs> um, I, I also saw that you uh, either published or did some work on the Army of Darkness RPG. I wrote it, yeah. You wrote it? That's awesome. That's one of my favorite movies. Well, Evil Dead 2. Army of Darkness. Was so Army of Darkness is fun, right? But our, Evil Dead 2 is the pinnacle of human achievement. It's amazing. <laughs> and I don't watch things more than once. I just don't have a lot of time. But uh, I've probably seen Evil Dead 2. At the time I wrote it, I'd watched it about 42 times. So I've probably seen it over 50 now. Now I had to rush it a lot to write the book, too, but uh, including all the alternate endings. But, uh, yeah. Is that still yeah. available? Uh, I don't know. Don't know. But the alternate endings are mostly in Army of Darkness. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, I've got the, the Necronomicon version. I've got every version you can imagine. And I've been lucky enough to meet Bruce a couple of times. And you know, he's just an awesome guy. He's exactly what you would expect him to be. Super mm -hmm. nice. Kind of yeah. an asshole. <laughs> in a funny way. Yeah, I, I met him. Uh, he did a book signing here in Tucson last year, maybe the year before. Okay. And, uh, you know, I got to ask a question during the thing and all that kind of stuff and got the books on. I, I gave him a card. I'm like, hey, I'd love to have you on the show. And he's like, ah, like, I don't, you know. I yeah. don't book any of that shit. <laughs> just just <Yeah>. keep going. <laughs> but yeah, he was—he was, he was a lot of fun just to listen to him uh, tell. You story. know, he played Briscoe County Jr. in a Deadlands live action, right? I know he did Briscoe. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, there was a Deadlands live action in Origins '94, I believe. We huh. didn't run the LARP because I don't—I don't run LARPs, but uh, somebody else did, and he was there, and he played Briscoe. 
and uh, he was awesome. That's that's very cool. <laughs> he came up and gave the Hall of Fame award to Darwin Bromley for us, which was really kind. And then, of course, we got him to do the forward to the anthology and the uh, that edition, the Deadlands edition at the time. He was great. Didn't ask for any money or anything. Super kind. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. He's he's been in, he's definitely been in some good stuff. Mm -hmm. And he seems like a good dude by all accounts. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so next year is uh, the Savage Cruise. Is this the first one? It is, yeah. Now, we didn't put it together or have anything to do with it other than help promote it once it got going. It's uh, Chris Landauer and uh, Louis Marquettos and some other guys up there in the Denver Gaming Association have just you know pushed this thing and made it happen, the, the Rocky Mountain Gamers, and we are just we're thrilled. So I can't wait. It's going to be a blast. That's awesome. I'll be there as well on cool. the inaugural uh, cruise, so that's very cool. Awesome. <laughs> I, I finally booked my return flight tonight. I was like, shit, I really got to do that. So I'll get stuck in New Orleans. My wife and I are going to drive. We we like to drive and explore. So we're going to drive and stay in New Orleans for a couple nights. That's yeah. cool. I'm going to go in uh, Saturday. So I want to go to the jazz club, see live jazz in New Orleans. Like that's. Okay. You know, buck, buck you get a chance, uh, maybe after your jazz club, Try to do a ghost tour in New Orleans. Hmm. So I don't believe in ghosts. I don't believe in the super, supernatural, but I love ghost tours. You know, they're usually really informative. The stories are fantastic. And the best one I ever did was in New Orleans. So I'm hoping for a repeat performance. Hmm. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to have to check There's that out. Creepy stories in New Orleans. Oh, I'll bet. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, so. When we get back on Sunday, I'm not going to fly out until like. 7 30 and spend a whole day just tooling around the city check yeah. out the cemetery awesome. and the voodoo museum is there and yeah. there's like a murder museum or something go to, go to jackson square and hang out get a beignet at cafe du monde yep yep yeah it looks like there's a lot of cool stuff down there it's right on bourbon street so actually there's a fantastic world war ii uh museum as well i saw that too yeah 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 really? definitely have stuff to keep you busy yep it'll also be raining guarantee it so oh, don't say that maybe not in January, <laughs> but every time I've been there, it was just pouring rain. So well, you, you probably want to do Uber anyway. Cause they like murdered a bunch of people yesterday or whatever in new Orleans. <laughs> so I was thinking about walking and then I saw that story and I was like, ah, maybe I'll just use Uber. Oh, I didn't hear about that. I'll have to check that out afterwards. Uh, yeah, I guess a guy in a, in a club shot like 10 people or something. Oh man. I missed that one. Yeah. I, I mean, like I, I don't know what it was about or whatever, but oh, sorry, kind of kind of colored my uh, my view on the upcoming vacation. Well, it can happen anywhere, right? I mean, I went to Virginia Tech, which was one of the just safest, most easygoing places you'd ever want to be, and uh, you know, see what happened there. It was terrible. Yeah, let's yeah. end on a high note. Let's not talk about this crap. <laughs> well, so you guys were just in Tombstone. Uh, you had an I'm event going on down there. How, how did that go? That was fantastic. So that's all the Pine Box guys, uh, David Lapp, Christine Lapp, their whole crew. Uh, they did a fantastic job just organizing the event, getting people to all kinds of neat places and restaurants and tours and the shootout and all that kind of stuff. I got to just be a fly on the wall, ran one game, hung out, talked to people, watched the games, uh, the, the, the tournament, and got to meet um, the Cackler. I, yeah, I was <laughs> going to ask you about that. Oh, he was awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So it was a blast. And, you know, doing it in Tombstone is just so atmospheric, you know, right. a great little town. Right. Now, is that the first time you've had anybody cosplay as characters from any of your settings? Or, or is No, this we've seen it many times. I've never seen a cackler before. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one that really caught my eye that I noticed, you know, it wasn't just like a gunslinger or something, was a hanging judge. And I mm -hmm. got freaking creepy. That was a long time ago. But yeah, it was scary. And he had the black, complete black mask and everything. So, yeah. Very that's, that's neat. That, that's cool. I, I imagine that's, that's got to be like a really neat thing to see. Like, you know, you go through and you write all this stuff and you have all these settings and you're doing all this work, publish all these books and you turn around and like, there it is. It and sure is yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. very cool. Very cool. Yeah. We've seen Dr. Helster and Nicodemus Waitley. Um, haven't seen red yet. Seen smile and Jack. No. Cool. Smile and Jack. That was pretty good. Yeah. 
with all the settings that you guys have, have you ever thought about doing a Cthulhu setting or is this like saturated market kind of thing? It's, it's just saturated. Not- There's plenty of Cthulhu out there. Okay. Well, I, I just figure it's worth to ask. <laughs> we might have something that's got some Cthulhu crossover coming soon, but Ooh. yeah. Cthulhu it's a very, very different uh, version of it. So Cool. Very cool. Yeah. And, uh, and you're running as well as playing on the cruise? Yeah, but, yes. Uh, I think I'm, oh, yeah, I'm running my um, Justice League Dark versus the Midnight Sons and Daughters. So it's DC's horror characters versus Marvel horror characters. And I've run this five or six times now. And it's kind of a big free-for-all with a, a specific mission in mind and some secret objectives. So it's really pretty cool. And it's really neat because, and if anybody's listening that's going to play, Here's, here's a tip for you. So in Savage Supers, uh, you have all your powers, right? But if you spend a Benny, you can do what's called a stunt. And if you can convince us that it makes some sense, you could use any of your powers to duplicate another power, right? So, for example, if you've got web slinging, web slinging and it only moves you 12 inches around, let's say, you could actually do a stunt and pay for it as a teleport or speed or something that moves you much faster and say, well, I'm just going for broke. I'm going to, you know, swing left and right, every building carelessly and recklessly, whatever, or I'm going to use my firepower to cauterize the wound and do healing. And uh, those are, those are pretty lame uses, but when you see the game played and what people do with their powers, when about the third or fourth turn, things go nuts and it's really cool because that's when you start doing the comic book stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Of, of making up these wild stories of how they're, you know, they're going to go supernova or some other crazy thing. And it's it's just really cool to watch people's imaginations just start flowing. Yeah, you just got to get somebody to crack that nut, and everybody's like, "Oh." Yep. <laughs> yep. And I usually, you know, the first turn it's I'm like, "Well, you know, if you did a power stunt, you could do that." And they'd be like, "Oh, okay, okay, okay." And then it starts to slowly click around the table. Oh wait, so I can do other powers? Yeah, that didn't make some sense. And then boom, they're off. Very cool. That, that's awesome. It's that's fun. awesome. I don't remember if I signed up for that one or not. Three days of gaming on a on a cruise. Like, how cool is that? Yeah, right. Because we get to do all the cool cruise stuff, and then when it's just out at sea doing nothing, you know, you play games with cool people. Awesome. Yep. Absolutely. You know how many people are gonna wind up going? I the last count I saw was like sixty or so. Yeah, last I saw was sixty some. Very cool. Yeah, I, I I've been talking about taking a cruise for. I don't know, a couple of years now. I'm like, I don't have anybody to go with. I don't want to pay double occupancy. And uh, Daryl had posted on Facebook. He's like, oh, my roommate crapped out. You know, is anybody looking? I'm like, well, actually, <laughs> give me some information about that. Yeah. And Daryl, as I mentioned before, he's just great. So you'll have a wonderful time. Yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. I, I, have you been on cruises before? Or are you a- uh, Just one, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I've been on a, on a couple. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to it. It'll be nice because it's going to be cold as shit here in January. Right. It's, it's been cool here for Arizona. Anyway. Yeah, people, it's going to be down into the 60s here. <laughs> but it's like a cool and clammy, like it's really cold in the morning when I go to work. I know. I tell you, once you get acclimated here, whew. <laughs> yeah, it, it didn't take long. We moved out in the summer. And uh, by that winter, I'm like, man, you know, because it's, you know, it's humid. Like, you know, we came from the East Coast, it's 80%, 90% humidity. I came in, I'm like, oh, this isn't too bad. You know, by the end of the year, coming into the spring, you know, and then monsoon starts coming up. Like, oh, my God, it's so muggy here. Jeez, this is terrible. <laughs> it's like 30%, you know. Yeah, exactly. Ah, but it's beautiful. It's, it's definitely a different, uh, different kind of environment. But uh, it, it's yeah. very cool. Yeah, I love it here. Yeah, and and if you miss like trees and stuff, you just go up to Flagstaff. You get snow. Right. Well, so I grew up in the mountains of Virginia and the rolling hills of Ohio, and they're beautiful, and I love them. But I just I love the wide open spaces here. I like being able to see for miles. I like the stark cliffs and the the red rocks, and you know, even the, even the barren desert, which is nowhere near as barren as you think it is when you get out and start exploring it. And I'm a big runner, so I explore yeah. it a lot. You know, it's it's just really weird how you might think something is flat for two miles. And you'll just disappear in it, you know, in a hundred yards. It's really weird, but I just love it here. Yeah, it's it's great for outdoor stuff. I go hiking all the time. Madeira is right here near my house, so you know, in a half an hour, I can be in the mountain. It's great. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah. You know, we used to do uh, hiking in a, uh, up on the Appalachian Trail. I did all in New Jersey, part of the, you know, into New York and Pennsylvania. Uh, yeah. But like, that's a whole, like, you got to plan out like a whole thing. Like here it's, you know, you go up to Tucson, you go up to Mount Lemon, or you can yeah. you know, go out to Picacho or, you know, like there's just so many places to go. Yeah. And, like, I've hiked superstitions twice. Beautiful. I, yeah. I haven't been out there yet. Yeah. I haven't done Picacho yeah. either. Yeah. I haven't done that one either. Daryl's done it a couple times. Yeah. 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 One of these days. Yeah. <laughs> I just tend to go right here because it's super close. <laughs> sure. So yeah, well, cool. I, it was a uh, it was a pleasure having you on. I'm I'm glad we uh, we got a chance to do this. Uh, Arizona is great. I mean, we have so many you know awesome designers. You're here and and um, John Wick and Ron and Tracy. I mean, like there's just a preponderance of of board game and RPG designers, and I just, it, I'm flabbergasted that we have such an awesome community here. Yeah, there's quite a few. Yeah, it's uh, it makes for a very interesting convention experience. Like at RingCon when you came in, uh, you know, I'm sitting at the table with with John Wick and Ron. I think Tracy was there, and uh, you know, Ron's kids and like you know all these people just were all around. I'm like, I'm like how cool is this? Like we're just in Tucson. Like we're in you know nowhere Arizona. And like, wow, Tucson's <laughs> not nowhere. Tucson's awesome. I know, I know, but you know, it's not, it's not Philly. It's not, you know, you look yeah. some of these big convention right. areas and stuff, you know, yeah. uh, you know, PAX West and all that kind of stuff. And like, you know, we're just humble little Tucson. Like, wow, we've got like awesome, awesome people here. Like, it's just, it's really cool. Very, very, uh, I don't know. It's just cool. <laughs> yeah, we're, we, we certainly have an embarrassment of riches around here when it comes to awesome people to game with and, you know, well-known designers and, and authors, people like Mike Stackpole, you know, mm -hmm. and, and so many others. So, yeah. Yep. Awesome. All right. Well, I want to thank you for coming on. Hopefully we can do this again in the future. This was, uh, it was a lot of fun. Same here. Thanks for having me. Awesome. And I will see you, uh, if no other place, I will see you on the cruise in a couple of weeks. <laughs> a month, yeah. About seven, yep. seven, seven weeks, something like that. Yeah. Yep. It's yeah, it should be a blast. Week. Absolutely. And if you're just hearing about it, folks, I think there are some still some openings. There may not be though. So if you're interested, check real quick. Yeah, there's a it's um Savage Savage Cruise 2020. You can Google that, it'll take you up to adventure. I should throw a link in the show notes. Okay. I'll do that. <laughs> or Google Savage Cruise 2020. You'll find it. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah. All right, I'll do our outro stuff here. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the show. Uh, please uh, check out the sponsors. We have Birds of a Feather Coffee. You can get the legendary brew there. It's a nice, easy drinking medium roast. A little bit of money comes back to the show. If you use code LEGENDS10, you're going to get 10% off your order, and shipping is always free. Uh, ratings, reviews on iTunes, whatever your podcatcher of choice is, is immensely helpful. Uh, if you're interested in the cruise, in a couple of minutes, I'll have a link in the show notes. And, uh, oh, Shane, you guys are actually running, uh, I don't know if it's just a Cyber Monday special or is this a, a special coming up for the next few weeks? You know, honestly, I don't know. That's Jody Black's department. Uh, I just kind of sign off on things and don't pay as much of as much attention as I should because I'm working on Lost Colony. Uh, <laughs> so check it out and you find out if you're interested. Yeah. Yep. Check it out over at Pinnacle Entertainment. Redlands.com. There you go. Uh, some stuff's up to 50% off right now. So uh, check that out. You can uh, bone up on your holiday shopping, stuff those uh, stockings. And uh, thank you guys for checking it out. And we'll catch you next time. Thanks. Oh, we're not out yet. There we go.